Welcome to lecture 7 of Experimental Vibration Analysis. In this lecture, we continue the discussion of spectrum estimation from the last lecture. We will also look at how to estimate correlation functions, and we will discuss some practical aspects of spectrum estimation, that is, how to find which settings for block size, number of averages, etc. that we want to use. The content of this lecture is found in chapter 10 of the book Noise and Vibration Analysis. This lecture is divided into two videos. The present video is the first video and here we discuss the smooth periodogram estimator for estimating spectral densities. Then we will discuss the transient spectrum estimator and we describe an estimator for correlation functions. In the next video, we will present some practical spectrum estimation for both periodic, random and transient signals. In lecture 6, we learned that a periodogram is the magnitude squared of a long DFT of the entire signal, scaled by the length of the signal. We also showed that the straightforward periodogram is a bad estimator of spectral density. We also learned, however, that by taking several shorter periodograms, an average these in the frequency domain led to a good spectral density estimator, the Welsh estimator. Now, there's another trick to make the periodogram a good estimate of spectral density. We simply smooth it in the frequency domain. Smoothing means that we average surrounding values together. So this is illustration shows how the smoothing is done. A window, usually a simple rectangular window, is running across the raw periodogram. For each frequency of the smoothed periodogram, the periodogram is multiplied by the window and all the values are averaged. As you can see in this illustration, that this produces the green smoothed spectral density estimate. The smoothing of the periodogram is equivalent to the convolution with a filter. And thus it corresponds to the windowing of the time data applied by the Welsh method. In the uh, smooth periodogram method, we usually use a rectangular window in the frequency domain, as this has turned out to produce a good spectral density estimate. Other windows could of course be used, there is just little to gain from doing that. Furthermore, as stated in the book, Welsh's method and the smooth periodogram method both result in very similar spectral density estimates. So, you may wonder why we are interested in the smooth periodogram estimator when we already have another good estimator, the Welsh estimator. This is because there are some advantages with using the smooth periodogram estimator. First, the smooth periodogram estimator can be used to obtain spectral densities with logarithmic frequency increment. This results in smaller random error at higher frequencies. And that, in turn, is interesting, since the spectral densities we measure on structures are results of resonances, with bandwidths proportional to the natural frequencies. Thus, a logarithmic frequency increment gives constant resolution of resonances, and the lower random error at higher frequencies is then obtained while mainta maintaining the frequency resolution we need to resolve the resonances. Another advantage with the smooth periodogram estimator is that we can apply some signal processing before the smoothing process. For example, if there are harmonics in the data, these can be efficiently removed. This is sometimes useful in operational modal analysis applications, for example, but can also be interesting if a measurement is contaminated by power line noise you know, 50 or 60 hertz problems, depending on what the power line frequency is where you are located. 
We are now ready to define the smooth periodogram estimator mathematically. We first remind that the autoperiodogram of a signal x, which we denote p hat sub xx, is defined as 1 over l, the length of the time signal, times the magnitude squared of the dft of x. We here use the lowercase letter l for frequency because we want to use the frequency k for the actual frequency values that we want to compute. For a single signal, x, the autospectral density estimate by the smoothed periodogram estimator, which we denote s hat sub xx at frequency k, is simply the average over l sub s frequency values of the periodogram, which we denote p hat sub xx. Finally, if we have two signals, x and y, the cross-spectral density estimate is computed similarly from the cross-periodogram. You should note that the formulas described here are double-sided spectra. But it's a small step to multiply all values except the DC value by 2 and throw away the values corresponding to the negative frequencies. We showed that in the previous lecture. The smooth periodogram can be computed for every frequency in the periodogram itself. But we rarely need that many frequency lines. So here are some recommendations on how to compute the smooth periodogram. First, for a linear frequency access resolution, I recommend to define n half plus 1 frequency lines between 0 and half the sampling frequency corresponding to the frequencies that the Welsh estimator would yield. Then select frequencies k corresponding to k times fs over n, the same frequencies that Welsh's method would produce. Next, you should choose a smoothing window length L sub s being equal to the length of the data divided by n. For a logarithmic frequency axis, instead you should first compute frequencies f sub k on a logarithmic frequency axis. Then compute a growing smoothing window length L sub s to hold the ratio L sub s over f sub k constant. This will result in a constant delta f over f resolution. This will also produce a spectral estimate with lower random error, the higher the frequency. If you want to see how to implement this, you can see the Abravibe command apsdsp.am in the toolbox. Next, a few words about bias and random errors for the smooth periodogram estimator. The smooth periodogram estimate will have a bias error very similar to that for the Welsh method. This is shown in more detail in the book. The random error can be computed, at least approximately, as the normalized equivalent noise bandwidth B sub E n of the window divided by the square root of the smoothing window length. As we use the rectangular window for the smoothing normally, then b sub e n equals 1, and the random error is simply 1 over the square root of l sub s. Next, we will discuss the estimators for transient signals. As we noted in the lecture where we talked about spectrum analysis theory, for a transient, we can define a transient spectrum as simply the DFT of the signal multiplied by the time increment, delta t. This means that if there is no leakage, that is, if the transient starts and dies out within the measurement time, then the transient spectrum is equal to the continuous Fourier transform of the signal x of n. Note that the transient spectrum is double-sided from a scaling point of view, although normally we only look at it 
for positive frequencies. The transient spectrum is not available in most commercial measurement systems. Instead, it's more common to find the energy spectral density, the ESD. This single-sided spectrum is defined as 2 times delta T squared times the magnitude of the DFT, X of K, squared. This is equivalent to the square of the transient spectrum above, except for the single-sided scaling. Here are some recommendations for transient spectrum estimation. First of all, the time data for a transient should always contain the entire transient from before it starts until it has completely died out. Usually, therefore, no time window should be used, as there will be no leakage. You should remember from lecture 5 that if only the entire transient is captured, then the DFT result is the exact result of the continuous spectrum, sampled at the instances of the DFT bins. If it for some reason is impossible to measure the entire transient, an exponential window could be used to force the transient to zero. This will, however, change the spectrum of the transient, so it should be used with caution. You should consult the book for more details on this. Now we will look at an estimator for correlation functions. These functions are commonly used in operational modal analysis, so they are of quite some interest. You should remember that autocorrelation is the same as the cross-correlation of a signal with itself. Therefore, we will only look at cross-correlations, R sub yx, here. We remember that the correlation function is the expected value of the product of y of t and x of t minus tau for some time lag, lag tau. That can in principle be computed this way for continuous time. The uh, estimate of the cross-correlation r hat sub yx is 1 over t times the integral from minus t half to t half of y of t times x of t minus tau dt, where uppercase t is the length of the signals. You should note that this is the continuous convolution of the two time signals. Also, it's easy to realize that except for the time lag tau equals zero, there will not be uppercase t seconds of overlapping time data in x and y. Thus the equation here will lead to a biased estimator because we divide by a, an uppercase t which is larger than the actual amount of data. So instead we can form an unbiased estimator by rescaling the estimator so it becomes this instead. So we have r hat sub yx of tau equals 1 over t minus the magnitude of tau times the integral of minus t half to t half of y of t times x of t minus tau dt. Now we will look at a discrete estimator for correlation functions. First you should realize that the convolution of the two time signals is a very time-consuming computation and is not practical. Instead, we compute the correlation function as the inverse Fourier transform of a spectral density function. Thereby, we can use the FFT to speed up the computations. There are, however, some special considerations we need to take in order for this to yield good estimates. First, we need to make the PSD or CSD estimator differently than before. And secondly, we need to use zero padding in the DFT to avoid cyclic convolution. Here is the special estimator for the spectral density that we will use. We take it in a few steps over the next three slides. 
The cross spectral density S sub yx of R is a scaling factor over the number of averages times the sum of y sub mz times x sub mz complex conjugate. The spectrum x sub mz is the DFT of segment x sub m using size 2n divided by 2n. You should particularly note that there is no time window in this estimate, or more correctly, there is a rectangular window. This is because we are not going to use this frequency domain spectrum. We are going back to time domain, and then the window should not be used. What we obtain in the time domain is the exact discrete convolution of the two signals. The, D of T, the DFT of size 2n in the spectrum x sub mz is formed by using zero padding, which means that the upper n values of x sub mz, or x sub m of n equals zero. This zero padding is used to avoid cyclic convolution. And if you don't remember this, you should go back to video 5b or section 9313 in the book. Also note that segment x sub m is formed in such a way that each segment m comes from a block of size uppercase n from the original signal with no overlap. Furthermore, the scaling factor s sub c is obtained by as 2 over the frequency increment delta f which can also be computed as 2 times n over the sampling frequency f sub s. The factor 2 here is a compensation for the n zeros in the zero padding. Finally, the unbiased correlation estimate is obtained by taking the inverse of the special CSD estimate s hat sub yx and scale it by n over n minus m times delta t for the lags m from 0, 1 up to n minus 1, and scale it by n over m minus n times delta t for the lags m equals n, n plus 1 up to 2n minus 1, corresponding to the negative lags m. You can explore the Abravibe command file at axcore.m to see how to implement this correlation estimator. This concludes this video. You should now proceed to video 7b.